Hello and welcome to airway clearance therapy. So we will talk about suctioning in this PowerPoint as well as other methods to help with airway clearance therapy uh, when someone's on mechanical ventilation. Now there is a big method here of making sure we got all the right categories of airway clearance which includes mechanical, right? Uh, when we look at this, we could also think pharmacological, we could also think about humidity, uh, we could also think about what the causative organism, if it's an organism that's causing uh, secretion production. So there's a lot of ways to approach airway clearance therapy with mechanical ventilation. So let's get started. Uh, the big picture, pick the technique that is best for the patient. When we're looking at this, the technique that's best for the patient will vary from patient to patient. You can't just say all vented patients need this device, this MetaNeb device. That would be great and it would make our job a lot easier if we had one stop solution to all of this, but not one solution is going to be best for each patient. Some patients might benefit better from pharmacological therapy. Maybe they have intracranial pressure issues and doing something that adds airway pressure to their ventilator circuit, which could increase intracranial pressures, may not be appropriate, obviously. So uh, that's where you have to pick the technique that's best for that patient. What will that patient respond to that does not cause any harm? Remember, the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm, right? So I need to pick something that will do the most work that avoids uh, causing any potential harmful side effects. So risk versus benefit analysis will be a big part of this. Uh, procedures different from non-intubated patients. You're going to see even things like uh, chest wall therapy, uh, different things like that will be a little bit different from non-intubated patients so just be aware of those differences uh, these these big things that for airway clearance can include suctioning but i'm going to stress this right off the bat here and you're going to hear me go off the uh, uh off on this later on but suctioning is more about tube clearance than airway clearance for this one uh, when you are suctioning and when you put that catheter down the ET tube, there was at one point a thought about deep suctioning where you go until you meet resistance. Well, what's the resistance that you're meeting? Well, ask those people that say go until you meet resistance. Ask them what they're meeting. It's going to be the wall of the airway. So if you cause trauma to the wall of the airway, what happens to the ciliary motility? What happens to secretions? Are you going to produce more secretions as a result of airway stimulation or less secretions? Right? So start thinking about this. Is it a painless maneuver or can it be painful if someone, you know, stabs a catheter inside your trachea? Uh, so these are things to think about. So when we're doing suctioning, don't think about suctioning an artificial airway as airway clearance. Think about it as tube clearance, right? So if there's something stuck at the end of the tube, there's a little bit of phlegm that's hanging out on the tip of the ET tube or the tracheostomy tube. Great, let's go in there and get it. But uh, don't think that, hey, this patient's got a lot of thick secretions. Suctioning is going to be our key component here. No, that can be part of uh, this whole th big picture. But when we're looking at this, it's not the primary method of getting airway clearance therapy. It is just a method of making sure their tube is clear and unobstructed. Uh, other things that we'll be talking about, aerosol delivery to the patients, uh, postural drainage, percussion, vibration. Uh, how does that fit into the picture, especially with mechanically ventilated patients? Fiber optic bronchoscopy is an option. Remember, uh, this can be a little tricky with an artificial airway as you're occluding part of their airway for this. So they could hypoventilate, desaturate. Um, especially if you're suctioning quite a bit, to have atelectasis. So there are some things to think about that as well. Uh, and then pharmacological therapy, which is not a bad thing to think about with most of our patients. So can we use any of these exclusively? Yes, we could. But sometimes it's a combination of the above. Can we do pharmacological therapy uh, and give them uh, normal saline or hypertonic saline to help with the airway clearance? Yes, we could. And then we could also do something like fiber optic bronchoscopy if they have really thick tenacious secretions that are causing a lot of mucus plugs, right? So we can do both of those. It's not 
anything against us doing multiple ways of approaching this. Uh, other things to think about too with airway clearance, especially if they have thick secretions, is adequate humidity on your ventilator. Does this patient have thick, sticky secretions? If they do, that actually may be an indication to switch them from a heat moisture exchanger over to an active heated humidified circuit as well. So these are things to start thinking about. If I have someone with thick sticky secretions, maybe an HME may not be appropriate for this patient. And they, the secretions may be a lot thinner and more humidified if we switch them over to a heated humidity circuit. So when we're looking at this, suctioning at fixed intervals is not, I repeat, not appropriate and should only be performed with evaluation evaluation so i'm only going to do this after i see the need to do this there are many of providers out there that every time they go in to see an artificial airway patient just go ahead and jam that to that suction catheter down their tube right so suctioning is always a prn maneuver it's always as needed and it's only performed after there's a need for it that's shown itself so suctioning at, at timed intervals just because is not a good answer. It's not a good response. Yes, there are people out there that do this. That does not mean it's a correct method. Uh, it, and in fact, in some studies, it shows that it could actually be detrimental to the care of that patient. So suctioning at fixed intervals is not appropriate and should only be performed with evaluation. In other words, with an indication for it. Hey, you hear coarse breath sounds uh, right below their trachea uh, uh, in their main stem airways. You have uh, visible secretions in the tube, whether it's a trachea or ET tube. Uh, you have uh, some issues there. So let's go ahead and suction right but that's only with evaluation if you're saying airway clearance therapy suctioning is only for tube clearance therapy right we're not jamming that catheter into their their right lower lobe that that's not appropriate and that could cause a lot of harm right so make sure suctioning at fixed intervals is not appropriate it should only be performed with evaluation suctioning is based on patient assessment findings so give me some examples of some patient assessment findings, right? Uh, if you hear coarse breath sounds in the in the central part of their airways, in there around where their trachea and their main stem bronchi could be, yeah, that could be great. If you see visible secretions in the ET tube, like what we just talked about, those are all things that could help us know when to suction this patient. Uh, and a neonate, it could be something like bradying down, where the heart rate's bradying down, uh, and that could be a sign that their airways occluded as well right so little things like that is what we would be looking for now there are other examples but those are just some primary ones there shallow suctioning is catheter insertion to a depth that approximates the length of the artificial airway uh, this is not something people tend to do a lot of the current culture as of recording this video unfortunately is to do what's called deep suction which is down here uh, shallow suctioning you insert the catheter to the depth that's approximately the length of the artificial airway whether it's the tracheostomy tube or the ET tube uh, there are suction ballards that have numbers on them where you can actually know exactly where you're at with the tube so let's say the last number on the artificial airway is 21 and then I'm going to take the 21 centimeter mark of the art artificial airway and I'm going to match it up to the 21 centimeter mark of the suction ballard. Now, if there are three centimeters above the carina with the tube on the x-ray, then I can do a plus one, plus two. Am I hitting carina? Am I hitting the airway wall? Probably not. But if there is secretions hanging out at the end of that tube, guess what? I got it, right? And did I have to hit their their airway wall did I have to cause trauma did I have to cause a potential for bleeding did I have to cause pain to do it oh absolutely not all right so when we're looking at this there's shallow suctioning approximate length of the artificial airway uh, there's a lot of people that don't think that's appropriate and what I say is what's more appropriate actually doing airway clearance therapy or just doing tube clearance therapy because it's convenient uh, 
tube clearance therapy is great for when it's indicated, but if we're talking about lots of thick tenacious secretions throughout their whole airways, then they need something more than just someone jabbing a, a, a suction catheter into their carina every four hours. Uh, deep suctioning, which is this next part here, is a catheter insertion until the resistance is encountered. Uh, that's why I put in here carina stabbing. Um, it could be carina, it could be the wall of the trachea, it could be on the main stem, it just depends. But uh, then it's withdrawn one centimeter before applying suction. That's the definition of deep suctioning according to the textbook. So when we're looking at deep suctioning, uh, you'll see this as a cultural practice out there. And you'll have to follow your hospital's, hospital's policies and procedures, however, I would also encourage you to look up the evidence on deep suctioning currently and what it does to the airway, what it does to the secretions, what it does to the patient, and start to take that into mindset before you fall into that culture. All right, there are two methods of clearing uh, secretions from an ET tube or tracheostomy. Uh, there's open suctioning and closed suctioning. Uh, open suctioning is where you would disconnect from the ventilator, right? And then you would uh, use sterile technique and you would insert a suction catheter, just like what we do with nasal tracheal suctioning. You would in, uh, advance a, a sterile suction catheter uh, down the airway, uh, go ahead and apply suction and swirl as you pull out. And then once you're done with your suctioning maneuver, go ahead and reconnect the ventilator circuit. The other one here is closed suctioning and this one's most popular uh, this is where we usually use a suction ballard of some sort uh, it's performed without removing from the ventilator so they get continuous ventilation and continuous oxygenation uh, we also don't expose them to whatever's in the room as far as infection control which is great uh, and then also the another thing that you'll see here and it's not listed on this is uh, probably a lot less chance for atelectasis and atelect trauma, right? When you take them off the ventilator, what happens to their airways, right? They would collapse, right? Or they're trying to breathe through that tube. They don't have as much pressure or volume to support their breathing. And so there's a chance that they could develop atelectasis from that procedure. Not only that, but when you suction, you're also suctioning out not only secretions, but gas out of their lungs. So take that into account as well. So when we talk about open suctioning, are there times if you don't have a ballard, you might have to do this? Absolutely. But traditionally, closed suctioning, usually used with a ballard, is performed and those are the advantages of closed suctioning it can maintain continuous oxygenation continuous ventilation and it reduces the breaking the circuit you're going to hear this a lot in mechanical ventilation about breaking the circuit the ventilator circuit the more frequent the ventilator circuit is broken to put in hmes to take out hmes to transport patients and so on and so forth to bag patients and so on and so forth the more risk that patient is for an infections. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we try to limit as much as possible. So tr not opening up the airway as frequently is a big component to reducing ventilator acquired conditions like pneumonia. So suction pressure should be at the lowest possible uh, to effectively clear the secretion. So uh, it depends on your patient population here. According to Egan's, the suction pressures uh, for a neonate are 80 to 100. Uh, 100 to 120 for a child and 120 to 150 and all those are millimeters of mercury for an adult. Uh, so make sure that you know the appropriate suction uh, suction pressures if we use too high of a suction pressure for a patient what could ultimately happen Derek what's the problem uh, well the big thing is uh, bleeding and trauma of the mucosa which makes more secretions we're gonna lose oxygen in their lungs lose P big AO2 if you will right we're gonna lose that ability to get oxygen into their bloodstream we're gonna lose ventilation with it if you will because we're sucking out gas right you're like we're sucking out CO2 well you'd be sucking out oxygen as well so there are a lot of downsides to using the higher methods besides things like vagaling if you do deep suctioning, <laughs> I hope you don't, uh, vagaling if you do deep suctioning or uh, any other issues with it. So 
when we're looking at this, uh, especially if someone has PVCs with suctioning, right, going to a lower suction pressure or doing intermittent suctioning might be appropriate for that patient. But you got a range. Hey, if you're using 150 on an adult, maybe you go down to 120 and see if you can still remove secretions at 120. Remember, it's for tube clearance when we're suctioning not airway clearance therapy, right? It's tube clearance, not airway clearance therapy. So if they have thick sticky secretions that it's not bringing up, uh, it should at least bring it up from the end of the tube, artificial airway, uh, and in the airway. And if it's not, then we have bigger things and they might need something like a bronchoscopy. They might need more aggressive actual airway clearance therapy. So AARC for suction pressures, again, I already went over these with you. Uh, for adults, uh, pediatrics, and neonates, make sure you understand those suction pressures. It is common to see higher pressures than these in many clinical settings, uh, but there are potential dangers to this. Some facilities might have it where you put the suction on max. Well, let's say that patient is a severe ARDS patient. Let's say they're a severe COPD or let's say they do have really bad pulmonary impairment of some sort or cardiac impairment. What are the dangers? The dangers, of course, bleeding and trauma, adding that to whatever condition the patient's already going through, losing oxygenation, losing ventilation, creating more secretions. All of these would be your potential risks. And what's your benefit, right? What's your benefit from this? Maybe some uh, extra secretions will come out here and there. But if you actually did proper airway clearance therapy, right, which includes pharmacological, which includes mechanical, so on and so forth, that may make a bigger difference than just going up to a max on your suction pressure. Now, if we're in a bronchoscopy, that's a whole separate scenario. We'll do a whole separate video on that. Uh, but bronchoscopy, remember the, the, the catheter or the, the multi-purpose port that we're using to suction is much, much smaller. So your ability to cause atelectasis, cause all these other things, is impeded because the smaller catheter. So it needs more pressure to get the same amount of secretions through it. So that's why when we do bronchoscopies, we may turn it up to max. That's a whole separate thing a whole separate video for that. There are currently no experimental studies available to support suction values currently as of recording this video and from what's in your textbook. There's not out there, so that's why it can vary out there. Please stick with at least what the AARC clinical practice guidelines suggest and look for these signs, especially if you're at a place where you see a patient that has new onset of bleeding or trauma. Let's say someone's on blood thinners. Do you want to start causing bleeding into their airway? Uh, do you? They already have lots of secretions. Do you want to cause more? Uh, do you want them, they start throwing PVCs on their EKG? Are those things that you want that to keep going on or do you want to mitigate that by not only pre-oxygenating but also taking them down to a lower pressure or doing it intermittently. So things to think about with suctioning. So when we're looking at suction, we're looking at issues that could be uh, a big thing with these patients because uh, if they're infants or they're tracheal reconstructive patients uh, or let's say they're post pneumonectomy, uh, they're, they could be very sensitive to suctioning and we got to be prepared and careful. So the diameter of the airway is a big thing and we don't want to go pa too far past their airway as well because that could cause trauma. Well, these patients are very high risk for trauma. So the suction catheter should never be inserted more than one centimeter below the distal tip of the tube. Once again, never more than one centimeter below the distal tip of the tube, whether it's a trach or an ET tube. The diameter of the suction catheter is determined by the artificial airway size. And that's what we'll get into this equation down here. So the smaller the tube, the smaller the suction catheter size should be. If we don't, if we make really small tubes with really big suction catheters, what are we doing to that patient's airway every time we're suctioning? We're occluding it, right? We're causing an airway obstruction. And we're making it hard to breathe. We're making uh, air trapping worse. We're making uh, the ability to oxygenate and avoid any negative side effects, we're mitigating that altogether. So when we're looking at this, the, the suction catheter size should not exceed 0.5. 
50% of the internal diameter of the artificial airway for children and adults and should not exceed 30% of the internal diameter for airway for infants, all right? So infants especially, remember those kids are very, very prone to atelectasis. Very, very prone, uh, especially if they're a newborn. Uh, I know newborn and infants aren't exactly the same here, but um, they're more prone to airway collapse and compromise. Uh, and you're really talking about really small tubes there. So that means you're a higher chance to obstruct their airway and they're very sensitive to their ventilation. The catheter size are based in what's called French units. I didn't come up with this. So how do we convert it? So uh, when we're looking at this, it's diameter of the tube times 3.14, all right? Or to shorten it up, three, right? So we're gonna take the ET tube size in centimeters and we're gonna convert it to French so that way we don't exceed the 50% or the 30%. So we're gonna take the tube size by three and then we're going to divide it in two or cut it in half or less to figure out what tube size. So let's say we had an 8.0 ET tube. So 8.0 times three is 24. All right, so 24 divided by two is going to be a, a 12 French suction catheter. Right, so that's going to be a, a suction catheter that takes up 50% or less. Right, if we do a 10 French, that would be less 50% uh, or less of their ET tube diameter. So, in this case, with this patient that has 8.0 tube, according to this, you would use a 12 French suction catheter that should help mitigate the desaturations, the de the poor ventilation issues, uh, the other obstructing of the airway issues that you could see with this. Uh, times three divided by two is what you need to remember to convert this. This is the equation you also need for your board exams for the NBRC. Right, that is the equation. They'll ask you what size suction catheter to use for a certain um, ET tube size, and that's the equation that you're going to use. You're going to take the tube size times three, and then which converts it to French, and then divide it by half or less to pick the right size suction catheter. Now let's talk about the suction maneuver itself. When we're looking at the maneuver, the big thing to remember here is A, make sure it's indicated before you ever start, right? Make sure you're indicated. Remember, it's not appropriate to do it on timed intervals or anything like that. Make sure there's an indication based upon evaluation to do it. Uh, duration, when you go into suction, duration should not be any longer than 15 seconds. Uh, be careful of this. Uh, if a patient desaturates very quickly, uh, you may have to do a shorter time constant here. But if the patient, uh, let's say they do have a lot of secretions stuck at the end of their tube, uh, I'm not, once again, I'm not saying deep in their lungs, but stuck at the end of their tube, then you may, you have a little room here for time as long as they don't have any negative effects with it to suction as well. So you could still do a, a nice little longer time interval there. Just understand they're at higher risk for those side effects that we talked about with that last slide. Shallow is suction is recommended over deep suction. Uh, and of course, I've already talked in depth about that. Um, so shallow suctioning uh, is, is less likely to cause pain, agitation, it is less likely to cause trauma and bleeding, less likely to cause ciliary immotility, uh, less likely to cause uh, secretion production because of irritation of the airways, less likely to probably cause bronchospasm as well. So shallow suction is recommended over deep suction. Once again, if a person needs quote unquote deep suctioning, then they may need airway clearance, not tube clearance, but airway clearance therapy. Uh, deep suction has not shown to be superior and is associated with trauma. And in fact, your textbook cites this, right? It's not just my opinion here. So be aware of this. Uh, when you're looking at suction, 
intermittent versus continuous suction. Uh, why would we do intermittent suction as we're pulling the tube out? Remember, you don't suction as you advance. You only suction as you pull the catheter out. Well, why would we do intermittent? Well, let's say they do desaturate, and we've already tried decreasing the suction pressure, right, and the time interval. Well, one thing I can do as I'm suctioning is to do intermittent suctioning as well. So that is something there. So the advantage there is less atelectasis. Uh, less side effects in theory, but the the trade-off, if you will, is going to be that they there you may be able to mobilize less secretions because of that. So just keep that in mind. Hazards and complications of suctioning. This is a big one to pay attention to. The loss of pressure or a leak in the system uh, or a full uh, full canister. So if you're suctioning and you lose pressure. So you're suctioning, this is a troubleshooting slide, once again, you're, you're suctioning and you don't have a lot of pressure for some reason, there might be a leak in the suction system, so something might be slightly disconnected or off, or the canister uh, full of secretions might be full. Uh, big hazards associated with suctioning, uh, discomfort, anxiety, not just for you, but also for the patient. Uh, and that's something just to be aware of, especially if we're on light sedation. And that's the newer thing that is. And even no sedation ICUs are out there too. So be aware. Uh, is it going to hurt if you ever have water and you drink and it goes into your trachea? Does it feel comfortable having someone throw water into your trachea? Absolutely not. Uh, same thing with deep, uh, with instilling saline. Instilling saline has actually been shown to cause or be associated with ventilator-acquired conditions or pneumonias because it washes something called biofilm from inside the artificial airway into the rest of the into the rest of the airways, and that can cause a pneumonia. So things like that. When you talk about instilling saline every time you suction, well, when you do that, you're pretty much causing harm to the patient because not only can you be causing a pneumonia and causing potential life-threatening effects because you're causing a pneumonia, but also what's the comfort level? What does that, that do to the pain of that patient? What does that do to the due to that patient's ability to tolerate? Uh, it, it creates a traumatic experience for them. Coughing, especially if you do that deep suctioning thing. Uh, just regular suctioning where you just do one centimeter past the ET tube can still produce a cough as well, right? That that can be a natural response, but especially if you do that whole deep suction thing. And I hope I've convinced you that that may be a cultural practice that uh, should be going away. Uh, bronchospasm, especially if you hit the trauma of the airway. Uh, hemorrhaging, bleeding, especially with deep suctioning. Airway edema, especially with deep suctioning. Ulceration of the mu mucosal wall. Don't you see most of these can be highly associated with deep suctioning, right? So think about this, between shallow suctioning, going one centimeter past the ET tube, or deep suctioning where you go until you hit something and then you pull back and start suctioning, right? Start thinking about this, right? You'll be your own practitioner out there. I once again, I encourage you to follow your hospital's policies and procedures, but uh, I encourage you to think about this evidence. I would encourage you to think about these hazards and complications. If it was you on the other side of that suctioning maneuver, uh, which method do you think would be most appropriate? All right, complications are usually associated with the duration. So sometimes the duration is a little too long. We might see desaturation, PVCs, things like that. Um, so one of the things that we could do to mitigate that is we can turn down their suction pressure. Uh, we can decrease the catheter size if we're not using the appropriate size. Let's say we're using too big of a catheter size compared to the baby, right? That baby could be desaturating and deoxygenating very, very easily. So we might have to go down on our suction catheter size. Another thing that helps with this is pre and post oxygenation or ventilation with kids. Uh, so where we do a suction support mode, some ventilators have, or you just go ahead and uh, give them a higher FiO2 before and after the procedure uh, as well. So those are all things that we can uh, think about to help mitigate complications. Because if we don't pre-oxygenate, if we don't have the right catheter size, if we don't, if our suction pressure is too strong, or if we spend too long during that maneuver, it can be detrimental to that patient.
So hazards and complications, you've heard me already mention a lot of these hazards and complications. Reduced lung volumes is going to be one of the big ones, so atelectasis and hypoxemia. Not only are you suctioning out secretions potentially, but you're also suctioning out gas, which that's why suctioning at timed intervals is another reason why that's not appropriate. Hey, there, there's, there's not necessarily an indication there, just for a timed interval uh, is not an indication. Uh, so you could be causing more harm than good just by suctioning at each interval and each time you go in there uh, that could be causing harm. Now that does mean you need to be evaluating the patient so that they do have thick sticky secretions and it's in their central airways and it could come out with suctioning great. But if it's not, if it's there in the distal airways, uh, then we think about other methods of airway clearance therapy. Try to also limit the duration and amount of negative pressure, which we just talked about. Uh, Pre-oxygenate uh, or ventilate, which is what we do in the NICU sometimes with manual breath, before and after can help reduce complications. It's not a catch-all be-all, right? It's not going to ensure that there's no complications, but it can help mitigate desaturation and poor ventilation from also sucking gas out of their lungs. The open method of suctioning, which we talked about closed, which is usually your suction ballast versus open suctioning, can cause a loss of positive and expiratory pressure or loss of PEEP that keeps the respiratory zone and the transition zone stented open. Because remember, those two areas of the lungs, your conducting zone has cartilage that helps keep it open. All right, But when you get to the transition zone and the respiratory zone where all the gas exchange happens, that's where PEEP comes into play. Uh, and when we suction, we could decrease PEEP. We could decrease the amount of pressure that stents open those those uh, transition and respiratory zone airways, and it could worsen their hypoxemia. So when we're looking at open suctioning, where we disconnect them from the ventilator altogether, we use sterile technique, even though it's uh, the airway. Uh, we're gonna use sterile technique and go down and suction. We're losing all that positive airway pressure that helps that patient potentially. So uh, be aware, open versus closed suction, the benefits. If a patient is hypoxic and they're on the ventilator currently uh, and all you have is open suction, uh, it may be, maybe you have to assess whether or not that patient might be more appropriate to switch to a suction ballard. Hazards and complications of suctioning, I just mentioned it a little bit earlier, uh, cardiac arrhythmias. So keep an eye out for this, especially on your patients that are already having poor PaO2 issues or poor SaO2 issues, but more PaO2. So these patients, uh, they will usually start throwing what's known as a premature ventricular contraction. So we're talking about PVCs. Here. So the PVCs uh, is one of those signs if you start to see PVCs stop the procedure and provide oxygen. And we have already talked about this in other courses, but uh, any type of cardiac arrhythmias uh, when we're suctioning, that's new, stop and give them oxygen, right? Alert the care team that this change had occurred. So any type of arrhythmias, uh, not just PVCs, right? You're like, Derek, what if my patient goes into a run of VTAC? What if they go into anything worse than that? Uh, yes, you want to stop the procedure, give them oxygen and inform the care team. Uh, tachycardia easily, because uh, what's one of your body's physiological responses to hypoxemia or to stress if you're doing the deep suction thing? It's going to be increasing the sympathetic response. So tachycardia can easily be a big thing that can happen with that as well. Uh, bradycardia in the neonate population, uh, especially if there's secretions stuck in their tube and there's an airway occlusion going on, you usually see them brady down. Their heart rate slows down. Uh, hypotension or vagal stimulation, if you're using that deep suction technique, way more chance because what nerve is innervated at the carina, which is a split between the right and left main stem of the lungs? Well, yeah, that's your vagus nerve, right? The vagal nerve, right? So then you can see the heart rate and the blood pressure decrease uh, vagal stimulation. Does that sound like a good thing to make your critical care patient do? No. So once again, that's a more of a deep suctioning thing.
Uh, I have had it where an ET tube right after an intubation was pushed a little too far and the heart and blood pressure started going down. Guess what? The tip of the tube was sitting on the carina. Pulled it back a couple centimeters. Pulled back three centimeters, right? And then perfectly fine. Uh, another response that you could see is hypertension, more on your adults because of the sympathetic tone that it creates and stress that it creates, the pain and anxiety. Once again, do you see this probably more likely due to deep suction, right, than to shallow suction maneuver? What about their airways or intracranial pressures? Well, this is a big thing to think about as well. Infants and children have even more risks with suctioning. Hopefully you're seeing a whole theme here. Uh, catheters can give a pneumothorax an infinite and perforate the bronchus. So do you really want to do deep suctioning in this patient population? Hopefully you're thinking about deep suctioning as a practice altogether uh, maybe limiting it to only extreme, extreme scenarios or eliminating it altogether. That's not my call. That's your call, right? Sterile conditions used for these compromised uh, preterm babies. Uh, there's another thing that we have to do if we're going to have to open suction a baby. Uh, we need to have as much sterile condition as we can. Does that baby have a good, strong immune system, especially if they're preterm right now? No, absolutely not. So those conditions used for those babies is a big thing, uh, making sure we're as, as uh, careful as we possibly can be. In fact, a lot of places, there's NICUs that recommend changing their suction ballards every 24 hours on those neonates to avoid any um, possible infection that's in their lungs from staying and culturing in their suction ballard even. There is evidence behind suctioning uh, saline through the ballard after you've suctioned to clear the, the, the ballard, to clear the suction catheter. Yes, there is evidence behind that for sure. But it's not pouring it down their artificial airway. It's not to help get more secretions, quote unquote, unstuck, which actually we can talk about that in advanced pharmacology, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't help break up those secretions. What you're seeing there is a whole separate situation. Um, but understand, deep suction can perforate and give a pneumothorax to these little babies. So infants and children, deep suction, start to think about that. Uh, closed head injuries, now we're talking about closed head injuries, might have an increased intracranial pressure. So just inserting the catheter without applying suction can increase their intracranial pressure, increase their mean arterial pressure, affect their cerebral perfusion pressure by increasing it, and then that could cause major intracranial pressure issues like hemorrhaging, right? Uh, they could hemorrhage their brain into their spinal column. Not a good situation by any means, and hopefully they have things like a craniotomy or something like that going on. But understand, suctioning in your intracranial patients can be a very sensitive thing. It's not something you're just going to do every time you go into the room and expect no uh, potential hazards from it. Oxygenation and hyperventilation are important with, with patients, and we'll talk about the hyperventilation a little bit more with mechanical ventilation. I have a whole lecture about permissive, uh, about hyperventilation with intracranial pressures. It's only done for a short period of time, right, to give you a quick overview to help lower their ICPs. After that, the physio physiological response of the body goes away from it. So we can only do it temporarily. It's not something we can do for days and days. Uh, topical anesthetic given 15 minutes before may help reduce the increasing ICP. In other words, that would be giving the patient uh, uh, installation of lidocaine which uh, before you're doing this. But understand, when you're doing that, you're also washing biofilm through their tube into their airways, which could then cause a potential pneumonia, which could make their whole situation even worse. And what's the Hippocratic Oath? First do no harm, right? Um, so if you're going to deep suction, they say, hey, you can put some uh, lidocaine down the tube or something like that to help numb the cough, the gag response, the trauma response. Yeah, you're numbing it, but you're still causing trauma to the airway, so the airway is still going to create more secretions. So hopefully you're thinking about this deep suction thing, uh, especially with ICP patients or even neonates. Manufacturers recommend that these catheters be changed daily. Once again, 
uh, uh, follow your hospital's policies and procedures as it comes to this. Uh, so, uh, like I said, our we were behold to uh, keep our suction ballards and change them every 24 hours in our neonatal ICU. In the adult ICU, um, that was a whole separate story, but we were trying to limit breaking the circuit. Studies show no increase in mortality, ventilator-acquired pneumonia, or length of stay uh, when, uh, when the catheter is left in longer up to a week. So that's why some facilities may leave them in longer, but always follow your hospital's policy and procedures. Uh, other things to do is the pre-oxygenate or ventilate. Uh, if you're in the neonate, we usually don't like to play with their FiO2 on the preterm babies. But um, pre-oxygenate is something that we tend to do before we suction as well to help mitigate uh, any potential harm from it. Uh, and there are even some vents that have a suction support modes on them. So just understand what machine you're using. Or if you have a preceptor, hey, does this ventilator have a suction support mode? Uh, a lot of times when you activate the suction support mode, not only will it uh, limit the alarms during the procedure, but it will also pre-oxygenate as well. And then it will return the patient back to the previous settings once the procedure is over as well. So it's kind of a neat little feature that some of those vents have. Uh, be sure to remove the catheter from the airway after suctioning. It seems like I shouldn't have to reinforce that one, but nevertheless, uh, I have responded to some situations where a patient's desaturating, um, they're coughing, they're fighting against the ventilator, and I go to show up and lo and behold, someone went to suction and then they suction, but they didn't pull the catheter all the way out of their ET tube. So what happened? The catheter stayed in there a little bit and it caused an airway obstruction. Of course, if you're choking on something, you're going to fight against the machine, you're going to cough, you're going to desaturate, right? They were pretty much obstructing their airway. So make sure that you remove that catheter all the way from the tube after you're done suctioning, because if it's left in there, it increases air resistance and the amount of pressure it takes to ventilate goes up. And it can really, in some ways, decrease the amount of gas that gets into their lungs. Their tidal volumes can decrease because it will limit the pressure. Because a lot of ventilators, we set a high pressure limit. It says, hey, anything above this amount of pressure, don't keep giving a breath because I don't want you to blow a hole in their lung, right? So it could even cause them to hypoventilate if you don't leave it out. Uh, if you don't take it out after suctioning. Here you see uh, good examples of suction ballards that are out there. Uh, there are some of these that are numbered. Uh, this one does not apparently have the numbers on it, but this is where you can mark it on the outside of the bag. And I'm just marking this for there and be like, hey, this is uh, the length of the two plus one centimeter. So that way, when you're pushing this in there, when you get to that mark at the end there, hey, there we go. All right, that's as deep as you can do it. Uh, traditionally, you're going to put your hand and hold the ET tube and the ballard here. So you're going to have one hand hold that side. And then you're going to, with the other hand, inch this catheter into their airway. Once it's all the way to where it's supposed to be, right? Once again, I don't teach deep suction. But once it's to where it's supposed to be is where I'll go with that one. Then you're going to apply suction. And then you're going to slowly with rotation, right, with rotation, pull that catheter out uh, after you've applied suction on the thumb port. Uh, so this is what your typical maneuver would look like. Some of these have numbers on the ballards, and I can show you examples in our lab of that. Um, and the other thing, too, that you might see here is the thumb port. A lot of people will lock this, which means turning this 180 degrees around. And that means that if there's something like the bed rail hits the suction, this part of the suction button, uh, then it's not going to just automatically apply suction to the patient and decrease their oxygenation and all that stuff. Um, so, and other people's may not lock it. So that just puts that patient at risk then if something hits the suction button that wasn't supposed to. Uh, let's say they're rolling the patient for a bed bath or something like that goes on. Then the airway is being suctioned and they're not getting their appropriate volumes or oxygen so on and so forth. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, some of these will be locked. Some of these will be open and we'll play with that in the lab as well.
Silent aspiration. Uh, this is something that we like to talk about a little bit with ventilator acquired conditions or pneumonia, right? Ventilator acquired pneumonia. Um, large cuffs usually will develop folds and pharyngeal secretions that you normally create in your upper airway. Remember, you have like almost 1.1 uh, liters of fluid that drains from your nasal pharynx each day. And most of it goes into your stomach, right? So you have some stuff, not only saliva, but some stuff from the back of your nasal pharynx that creates secretions and it goes into your oral pharynx and your laryngopharynx. Well, some of that can leak through uh, the cuff into the lower airway and that's called silent aspiration. And there's specialized ET tubes, which we have in the lab and I'll show you those, um, that have a suction port just above the cuff to help remove secretions above the cuff. So that's something else that we can use. We just gotta make sure that we're using the appropriate pressure on those otherwise it can cause trauma to the oropharynx or the laryngopharynx it can cause issues there as well um, the idea here is having these special tubes that have oral suction to them might help reduce ventilator acquired pneumonias by conscious aspiration by actually removing some of that stuff from building up on top of the cuff so if we stop that then maybe we have less issues with a ventilator acquired pneumonia so you might see these, they're more expensive than standard ET tubes, that's why they may not always be used. Like let's say you're having a surgery done that's a three or four hour surgery. So they're not gonna use a superglottic airway, they're gonna use a subglottic airway. Well, they might just go ahead and use just a regular plain Jane ET tube for that because it's such a short duration of mechanical ventilation. But if you have a patient that's gonna be on a long stay, that's where this tube can be helpful. It's most effective in those requiring intubation longer than three days is what they're currently saying. So for short-term mechanical ventilation, for like a surgery, it, it doesn't show a difference as long as the person has a good proper oral care, uh, then, then great. But if not, if it's going to be prolonged ventilation, which they define as three days, then they strongly suggest something like this for oral, um, oral um, secretion management. So here is a picture of a high-low evacuation tube. So here is, of course, the pilot balloon, and this is what you'd inflate to inflate the cuff at the end of the tube. But over here is your suction, right? And here's your, you can see very slightly there, there's that little open port above the cuff there. That's going to help with any secretions that are building up above the cuff. So that way it's just not staying and is sitting on top of the cuff and aspirating down into the airway wall. So that's the whole point there. Uh, 20 millimeters of mercury continuous. These ones can get clogged every once in a while. So you might have to go ahead and uh, uh, aspirate uh, manually with a syringe or something like that. But uh, very helpful if we're trying to manage those secretions. All right, let's talk about another pet peeve of mine. I know I'm on a war horse today. This is not good. Uh, instilling three to five mLs of sterile saline followed by hyperoxygenation before suction uh, and its intent to loosen secretions and stimulate the cough. So that's what people tend to do is that instilling saline followed by hyperoxygenation. Uh, it's intended to loosen secretion, stimulate a cough, therefore have a more productive suction scenario. Great. Uh, when you have food or liquid that go into your trachea, like if you, you know, aspirate, uh, how does it feel, right? If I were to pour a bunch of saline down your trachea right now, three to five mils, right? Not a much, right? It's not much, right? Just pour it down your trachea right now. Uh, are you going to cough? Are you going to gag? Are your eyes going to water? Are you not going to feel uh, pain? Are you not going to feel anxious? Are you not going to change your respiratory rate? Are you not going to change your intracranial pressure? Are you not going to have those changes? So when we're talking about instilling saline with suction, there is, according to the textbook, this is not me, right? This is me quoting the textbook. All these things in bold here. Insufficient evidence supports instilling saline. Once again, insufficient evidence supports instilling saline. Once again, insufficient evidence supports instilling saline with suction. There is evidence to support clearing the catheter after you suction, but we're talking about instilling saline to loosen up secretions down the tube. Uh, studies actually indicate this practice may be harmful, right? This practice may be harmful. Instilling saline 
may be harmful to the patient. And we talked about that with biofilm and washing that down to the lungs. It dislodges biofilm from the ET tube or the tracheostomy tube and leads to a pneumonia, which can make their situation worse. What's the Hippocratic Oath? First, do no harm, okay? This causes irritation when we instill saline and coughing, which increases secretion production. So you're actually making your job worse by instilling saline. So, oh, and another thing, it can cause bronchospasm, right? Which is how well they're going to ventilate and oxygenate once you do that as well. All right. When we're looking at normal saline installation, less fluid is suction compared to what's instilled, right? You instill 3 mLs, 5 mLs. How much of that did you get back? I'm going to venture to guess zero, zero. Um, so not much is going to come back. And you've even seen this with bronchoscopies where we push a bunch of fluid for a bronchial alveolar lavage. How much comes back, right? If we're lucky, 10, 20%. If we're lucky, if we're the most perfect conditions with a good wedge and everything. So what did that saline do? It went further and further down the airway wall, including the transition and respiratory zone, which what does it do to surfactant down there? What does it do to the ability to exchange gas in that area, right? Think about this, right? Increases in volume of secretions by adding to potential an airway obstruction, right? We're increasing volume of secretions because we have this patient and we're causing uh, issues with the airway. We're causing stimulation of the airway. When the airway is stimulated, uh, does it create less secretions or more secretions? So of course, if there's something abnormal that's going to the lungs, it's going to create more secretions, which increases their potentiation for airway obstruction. Uh, it reduces oxygenation. We talked about this, especially if they have mucus plugging, if they're creating more mucus because you're, the people keep doing this then it can reduce oxygenation, but also when it's washing it down into the respiratory zone where it's impeding gas exchange, not only by diffusion, but also a dilution of surfactant down there. Uh, you can even have atelectasis and increase atelect trauma. Isn't that great? Uh, what happens usually here is it increases their sensation of dyspnea. They feel like they're struggling to breathe. Uh, does this sound like a good move to you? So this is my own quote at the bottom. RTs should instill calm to the patient, not saline, right? When you're in the room to evaluate that patient that's on a ventilator, you're there as an act of compassion. You're there to help the patient as much as humanly possible. Uh, and you're there to instill that calm and reassurance of that patient. You're there to help them in a moment of extreme sensitivity and need. You're not there to cause harm. You're not there to instill something that's going to have more risks than ever benefits that have been associated with it. Once again, there's no studies that show that that's been beneficial in stilling saline. All right, once we're done suctioning, Derek, what do we do? Well, you're going to evaluate. Do I need to go in and suction them again? Yes or no, right? Uh, how much did we suck out? Do we have a small amount of secretions, moderate amount of secretions, large amount? Is it uh, cloudy white secretions? secretions or the red blood tinge secretions or their pink frothy secretions um, uh, characteristics are they frothy like what I said before are they tenacious are they purulent um, and then one of the things that we got to do after we're done with this procedure is our basic assessment is the ET tube still in good position because can it move especially with the neonate pediatric world yeah uh, breast sounds did their breath sounds improve? Did we cause a bronchospasm? Did we cause them to get worse, right? We need to know, because if you don't listen and they're having a bronchospasm, that could be very detrimental to that patient. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of suctioning. Hopefully you got that down by now. You understand deep suctioning versus closed, uh, deep suctioning versus shallow suctioning, uh, closed system versus open system, hazards and complications, uh, as well as evaluating uh, and mitigating complications and evaluating for complications, what you would do to correct those. All right, so we have our patient. Derek, I don't want to do deep suction every time. I want to actually do airway clearance therapy, not just tube clearance therapy. Great. What about CPT? Uh, CPT can clear secretions and improve dys 
distribution of ventilation. So that can, especially if there's mucus plugging going on. Positioning can help drain the effective lung area. Uh, I always say thanks to our nursing staff. They were amazing at uh, rotating patients. They did it more for skin care than for respiratory care, but I loved it. It was a mutually beneficial situation because their extreme rotations of the patient to avoid uh, skin issues also worked to help drain different areas of the lungs passively. So that worked out really well. When we're talking about CPT, it can require two or more clinicians to accomplish uh, which can lead to extubation, loss of catheters. There's no evidence behind that. It's just more manipulation of the patient, especially if we do prone ventilation, right? We need more than two people. The, there's a chance the catheters and lines and stuff can come out. But uh, with, with positioning, just extreme right, right side, extreme left side, uh, up and down, those things are usually great uh, at helping aid us. Hemodynamics should be considered as well. If they're hemodynamically unstable, do we want to be rolling them so they're left side dependent, or sorry, right side dependent, where their abdomen is crushing their vena cava, right? So those are all things we got to worry about with hemodynamics. Uh, intracranial pressures as well is something else to put on there. With CPT, probably shouldn't be high on the list with those type of patients either. So positioning, uh, there's always supine, which is what most of our patients are. The 45 degree rotations, right side up, left side up, those are great. Those are the ones that we tend to do. Uh, return to supine, right, once they're done with the rotations. Uh, 10 degrees right side up supine, so that's right side up, and that should help drain that right lobe as well. So these are the positions typically that can work for your vented patients. So we're not talking about flipping them over into prone or doing the, the hips higher than the head or anything like that, like what you're taught with your classical CPT on a non-intubated patient. This would be mechanical ventilation CPT. Because of the difficulties that occur with postural drainage, the following may also be used. In other words, as an alternative to the classic clapping or CPT on the patient, we could try things like an oscillating vest. There's different products out there that can do this. Be aware, some of these oscillating vests out there may not have a bladder that allows for the patient to, the thorax to completely expand and collapse. So it could auto cycle the ventilator. So just be aware of that. And we can show that in lab, just remind me. Uh, vibrations, uh, especially neonates. So we don't like to percuss or shake babies, but we can also do vibrations to help mobilize them. Uh, on adults, we can do things like pneumatic percussors. Uh, there's devices like the MetaNeb which is on your board exams now, uh, where you can put that in line with the ventilator and we could always practice that. Uh, then there's other things. There's even home care ventilators now that have a cough assist uh, or a MIE, uh, insufflator exsufflator device, uh, which some people call the cough assist. Um, where you disconnect them from the ventilator, do the MIE, but now there's even ventilators, uh, home care ventilators that have that as a mode, which is kind of neat. Uh, so there are other ways to do airway clearance therapy other than just your classic positioning and clapping. Flexible bronchoscopy, we're getting close to the end here. Flexible bronchoscopy is a great way to do this because we can see it, it's directed, it's topical, uh, but it is invasive and it can occlude their airway. So we have to be careful on them. Uh, it can be used for diagnosing things like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. We can use it for culturing if we, they're not responding to broad spectrum antibiotics. Why aren't they? Maybe they have a fungal pneumonia. And that's when we can do a bronchial lavage and send it to see if it's a fungus that's actually in there. Uh, so we could do cytology or histology uh, on different areas in the lungs if we're having issues there. It removes objects from the airways, so it can be therapeutic, not just diagnostic. Uh, there's no need to numb the upper airway, which is great because usually we either go through the trach tube or the ET tube. Um, but if we're going through the ET tube, we do need to use a bite block. Uh, of course, uh, because we don't want them chopping down on that very, very expensive piece of equipment or breaking it off in the airway or any other hazards to their own teeth as well. So think about both sides on this one. Uh, we will need to adjust the ventilator alarms and settings for this typically. Uh, ventilator alarms usually will take our high pressure alarm 
really high for this procedure in order to avoid it from limiting their breath, in order to avoid hypoventilation. We'll go over this in detail as well together. Um, so we'll try to do that. Uh, the ventilator alarms will take the high pressure up and then FiO2 will probably increase it as well uh, to help because we're, what are we doing with this patient? We're occluding their airway, right? We're putting something and jamming it into their airway. We're causing an airway obstruction with this bronchoscope. So we do need to make sure that they can oxygenate and ventilate during the procedure. And if they start having desaturations or throwing PVCs or any signs of hypoxemia or hypoventilation, we need to pull out, let the patient recover, and then we can still continue the procedure as long as it's safe to do so. So it doesn't mean we can't do it, it just means that we just need to watch their vital signs and be careful with this. Um, so this can increase both secretions uh, uh, and stimulation of the airway, so we have to watch out with that. But what's your return of investment here? In, in the case of a bronchoscope, we might be able to get more back. Uh, uh, so uh, the other thing that we might need to increase uh, with our vent settings here is both their FiO2 and their increased pressure or PIP alarm, high peak pressure, high peak pressure alarm. Uh, both of those will help ensure the patient is hopefully not only ventilated but has the right FiO2 for an airway occlusion for that temporary what, uh, once we're done with the procedure, obviously we need to return those settings back to the previous settings, but that's going to help ensure stability during it. Uh, they might also have things where they might consider changing the mode to something like pressure control, or they might change to a PRVC mode. Uh, uh, so different things out there, uh, just follow your hospital's policy and procedure. Uh, there's there's different approaches to this. That's why I'm being a little vague here. Pressure control versus volume control, then we don't have to worry about poor ventilation, but the pressure should still be enough to bypass and give adequate volumes. There's no significant evidence that I'm aware of that changing mode during this will lead to better outcomes or negate outcomes. So that's why they may change the mode, they may not change the mode. There's no evidence to support it either way. All right, while using with ventilation, you will need a one-way valve. And I have a picture for it on the next one. Uh, one-way, one-way valve. Uh, that allows for us to push the bronchoscope into the ET tube uh, or the tracheostomy tube uh, without having gas or air or secretions come back up out of it. Uh, what percent lidocaine would most likely be used during this procedure? So since it's below the vocal cords, traditionally it's going to be 1%. 1% concentrations. Now each physician, they are a physician. They can order something different, uh, especially your pulmonology uh, groups. Uh, but tr typically anything above the vocal cords, we'll use a 2% or if we're doing the nebulized for a native airway patient, 4% nebulized but and anything below the vocal cords will do one percent have i seen it where we use two percent below the cords that's what the doctor ordered yes however typically that's something you want to communicate before the procedure ever starts but most likely it will be a one percent so that's what i will expect you to understand currently the patient is still placed under conscious sedation so under conscious sedation is the one thing you want to see here. So they can still hear you, they can still respond to certain commands, they're just not going to be very, uh, a, they're not going to have a high ability to respond to you in certain ways. So they're under conscious sedation. Uh, what does atropine have to do with bronchoscopy? Well, there's two answers. A, it helps uh, reduce the vagaling effect if you would nebulize it. So we're talking about nebulizing, right? Nebulizing it. So this is more for the boards. Uh, I haven't ever used atropine for nebulization in my practice. Your mileage may vary. But reduce vagaling, right? Because atropine is a parasympatholytic. Uh, it blocks uh, parasympathetic stimulation. Therefore, it increases heart rate and all that other stuff. So reduces vagal stimulation and it can help dry up airway secretions because it's a parasympatholytic, uh, blocks the parasympathetic stimulation. So therefore, those are two 
benefits of nebulizing it to your patient. Uh, hazard could be an increased heart rate, of course, but uh, nevertheless, that's something I want you to know, especially for boards. Uh, usually when we're doing bronchoscopy on a vented patient, it requires at least three people in the room. Uh, you want, uh, obviously, a, a respiratory therapist to help assist with the bronchoscopy procedure. Of course, the physician that's trained in bronchoscopy right, to do the procedure, as well as someone to provide medications, watch the vital signs, things like that. So typically that's a nurse, right? Typically that's the patient's nurse to do that. Um, but that's what we're looking at. That's their roles and responsibilities in that procedure. The therapist assists the physician with different instrumentation, collection, troubleshooting. Uh, there is someone responsible for monitoring the patient and the ventilator. So who's responsible for monitoring the patient and the ventilator? That is you, right? Right. You are also responsible for monitoring the patient and the ventilator. So it's a very busy time for you. Now, if you do have one other person in there, maybe you make them responsible for monitoring the patient and the ventilator. Or maybe the nurse is the one, besides assisting with medication, monitoring the patient and the ventilator. It's... It's a combined responsibility traditionally when we're looking at it. Here is the picture that I was talking to you guys about. So here is the ET tube down here, right? And then here's the ventilator circuit here. And all we did is put in this one-way valve. And I'll do it in blue. This is that one-way valve. So we can push the bronchoscope into it. And then gas can still flow go down the tube, gas is still flowing, going down the tube, they're still ventilating, we're obstructing the airway a little bit, but you know, we're still getting some ventilation and oxygenation going in there. And then uh, we can pull the, the, the bronchoscope out if they start to desaturate or anything like that and let them re-ventilate, re, re But overall, that's gonna allow for continuous oxygenation ventilation during the maneuver. Our artificial airways need need the appropriate sized bronchoscope. If we have a therapeutic scope, a large bronchoscope, and we're trying to go down a 6.5 ET tube, that may not work so well, right? We talked about no more than 50% of the internal diameter. Bronchoscopes tend to break that. And then especially, the bronchoscope may not even fit, especially if it's a large one, down some of these smaller airways. So we need an appropriate size bronchoscope is what this is saying. So sometimes on our smaller airways, we had to use the neon, uh, sorry, not neon, pediatric bronchoscope on those. Remember, it could occupy 50% or more of the radius. So that means we're gonna have those issues with desaturation, with atelectasis, with so on and so forth, right? Uh, to compensate for that desaturation, to compensate for it occluding their airway, we go ahead and increase FiO2 uh, usually to 100% for an adult, 100% uh, during the procedure to help compensate for that airway obstruction. This increased FiO2, sorry, this increased pressure will decrease delivered tidal volume. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we see with it occluding it more than 50%. This increased pressure will decrease delivered volume. So that's one thing that we have to do in some cases if we're going to leave them in a volume targeted mode is we need to increase pressure so that way it compensates for that low tidal volume, the high pressure alarm limit I should say. So that way it can use higher pressures to still give them that same tidal volume but we'll have to change it once we're done. Auto peep can occur with this large obstruction. So on those patients that have slow lung units, so we're talking about COPD emphysema here, slow obstructed lung units, uh, they can develop auto peep during this maneuver. So we have to watch out for things like that. We should silence the alarms and monitored exhaled what? In saturation during the procedure. So silence the alarms and monitored exhaled CO2, right? I'm a big fan of CO2. It doesn't say that's a requirement, um, but silencing the alarms and monitored exhaled volumes and CO2s are another thing. So uh, you can put volumes in there as well, tidal volume, uh, during the procedure. Um, uh, the reason why I liked exhaled CO2 as well in that, that area 
is because it will tell me about not only perfusion, but also ventilation, right? It tells me both of those things. But we should look at their exhale tidal volumes. If they're very, very tiny, we're obstructing very large percent of that tube, um, and then they could be causing desaturation. So tidal volume is the appropriate thing to go in there. However, CO2 is not a bad idea to monitor as well. All right, what about pharmacology? What are some other things we can do to help get rid of secretions besides manual? Uh, hey, we can do something like if they're dry, increase systemic hydration. What are the thoughts on that, right? Give them a half liter. Give them a liter of saline, right? As long as it's appropriate to do so. Uh, things we can do with the mechanical ventilator is increase the humidity level. And some heaters out there, you can actually change the humidity level. Other ones, not so much. Um, you could always nebulize different medications like normal saline or hypertonic. Hypertonic is using osmosis, right? Water follows salt. It's, if you nebulize that salty solution, then the water follows it and should help hydrate from the lamina propria layer of the lungs and then the solen gel layer. It should pull some of that water from those layers to help hydrate the, the gel layer therefore help unstick secretions. Uh, there's also things that the nurse could give, right? Like guafenicin or robitussin, right? There's those things that can help with airway clearance therapy as well. If it's pus-based, uh, especially in the NICU, they tend to be more purulent. They don't have as many mucins in their mucus. So pulmazyme, right? Or DNAs is another term for that, uh, would be a good idea. If it's uh, something like increasing ciliary activity, there's this medication that's called that has a sympathetic activity. We call them bronchodilators, but it can stimulate sympathetic activity. Uh, so like your albuterol medications, your atrovent medications can stimulate ciliary beat and motility, and that could also help as well. So little things like that could be a big thing. What drug do you not want to nebulize here? Well, especially for patients that are COPD. All right, listen to me carefully, and there's there's evidence that backs this up. COPD ears that have nebulized mucomist or acetylcysteine, the one that smells like sulfur, right? Smells like eggs, uh, has been shown to have a detriment in their pulmonary function, right? You can look that up. Uh, and so that's a one medication you do not want to necessarily nebulize, especially for your um, COPD patient population. Evidence does not currently support that. Um, is there still people as a cultural practice that still do it? Uh, probably, but uh, as far as evidence-based practice goes, as of this recording, it is not currently supported. All right, so hopefully you got some better ideas, not only about suctioning, deep suctioning versus shallow suctioning, open suction versus closed suction, hazards and complications of suctioning, right? Hopefully I preached that to you a little bit there. Uh, also, we talked about uh, manual airway clearance therapy with things like metaneb and uh, percussion and um, the vest, right? And things that can go on there. So we can always work with that in the lab as well. Uh, Make sure that you understand those hazards and complications. You know those procedures. If you're uncomfortable with even things like how to nebulize in line with the ventilator, those are things that we can go over in class, right? And we can go over them in other courses too as well. So make sure you go through this. Understand pharmacology could be a component on top of metaneb therapy with or vest therapy with your vented patient or so on and so forth right you're not just stuck to one of these methods suction only right no so as long as it's appropriate for the patient and understand the patient condition too not every patient are going to respond the same way to the same type of therapy uh what if i'm uh have a closed head injury patient with high intracranial pressures uh, do I want to be suctioning that patient routinely? No, that could make them worse. What's something that could actually help them? Well, that's where we look at the pharmacological. Could I nebulize hypertonic saline to help decrease mucus plugging? So on and so forth, right? So this is where you need to make a plan with your care team on what is the best airway clearance, not tube clearance, the best airway clearance for this patient, right? Sometimes that's things like systemic hydration, or even normal saline or bronchodilator or, right, what's appropriate for that patient. All right, thank you.